All right, guys, welcome back to part two of this week's Yawa. We had another great uh, string of questions, and we're going to get right back into answering your next question. Next question, life of Teddy underscore the GSP. This is an Instagram question. It says, should we be concerned with a smaller GSP? He is only 47 pounds at nine months old. I would say you should be concerned if your dog looks unhealthy. The size of the dog doesn't really matter. Male, female, all the things. There's a lot of genetics and there's a big variance in actual size. Um, maybe concerns could be related to whether or not you're going to show the dog does it meet breed standards, should the dog be bred. Those would be questions to ask. But as far as if your dog's nine months old, weighs 47 pounds, that's not something that ever falls into my category as a concern unless we see the lethargy or the dog is skinny, can't hold weight. You right. know, so maybe send us a picture. We're always a big fan of feeding to body condition. And if you send us a picture, I'm going to be able to say that dog looks healthy or not. I mean, if you have any other concerns about the health of your dog, I would definitely consult your veterinarian. Yeah. And we Throw typically see dogs continuing to grow height wise, stature wise through at least a year. And then if you keep your male, which is the male intact, yep. um, he he, yep. Yeah, if he stays intact, he has the potential to, to put on more fully... muscle mass as well until about two, I would say, is yes. when we usually see that full musculature development and our Somewhere max size two. and weight, yep. usually. So yep. but, he's still got plenty of growing time, and 47 pounds is not sound abnormally small for nine months old. No, because, I mean, structure-wise, like you're saying, height and length and all of those things being full... I mean, he'll probably be, by the time he's a year, 50 to 52 pounds, give or take, maybe five pounds in there. And then pack on a few pounds of muscle Four to five pounds of muscle. He's going to be upper 50s. I mean, that's that's in the vicinity of normal males, just on the on the smaller end of that spectrum. But um, like Vex, I mean, Vex is 60 pounds, 59, 60 pounds, kind of depending on where he's at. So that would be probably just about the size of him. And he's perfect. Practically perfect in Practically every way. Practically perfect in every way. So next question, <laughs> this is a good one from Instagram, LW underscore 4H underscore Prez. What is your thought on inbreeding dogs? So this can be a I very- I have an opinion on this. <laughs> go, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, we'll get to Ethan's opinion on this. I'm just going to talk a little bit about inbreeding dogs. So um, if you've ever looked at a pedigree online, especially one that we've got on our website with color coordination and- COIs and all the little confusing tidbits, people want to know what all that means. Yeah. We should probably do a tutorial sometime on that. But basically, to answer your question about inbreeding, that's typically what we call line breeding. We're trying to get specific characteristics more consistently out of a breeding program. So there is some inbreeding that goes on. Uh, you always want to look at that in walking a thin line of not too much, but just enough to build consistency in a program. We can start with some of the issues um, or misnomers or misinformation that people have. And I think the first thing that comes into play is when people talk about inbreeding, you think about, you know, get married to your sister or your cousin and then having kids that are mentally not correct. You have messed up children. And that's not necessarily the case, uh, nor is it the situation in with dogs. But what ends up happening is you, um, you make that gene pool that you're pulling from smaller. And when you are pulling from a smaller gene pool, more things are going to show up and those are going to be more good things and bad things. So... If there's bad things present, they're also going to show up. If there's good things present, they're going to show up. So you can more actually- More consistently. More consistently. Yep. So to uh, the best way that we can describe it is if you imagine, and these are the actual numbers. So if you look at, we typically look at 10 generation pedigrees. You have 10 generations from dog A and 10 from B. That adds up to 2,046 dogs. Now, if these two dogs would be, those are all unique dogs. Now- the more line breeding that happens now, those get smaller and smaller of And the reason dogs. that is because dog A has similar 
dogs in its background, in its pedigree, to dog B. Yep. So those dogs are repeated in that pedigree. So you don't have 2,046 unique dogs anymore. You have half that number or yeah. even less than half that number. So even that's less a lot of times, yeah. Yep. So like uh, a specific example would be if you, and this happens a lot, is if you take half siblings. So um, same dads, different moms. And then if the moms have any relation, that tightens it up even more. And again, that doesn't create problems in itself until you go too far, which I don't know what the magic number for too far is, but genetics, or excuse me, but nature usually does tell you. Um, if you start getting too tight, you lose things. Often in cattle, they see this. Uh, the first thing that goes is mothering instincts. So moms stop taking care of the calves, and that's not uh, beneficial in the case of raising cows. So that and fertility can go down. And as fertility, well. yep. So you, you run into those things. But as far as what was the exact question? So we what can, is our thought on inbreeding dogs? Okay, so I believe that. Line breeding, a uh, nicer term for, instead of inbreeding, but line breeding, which would be the term that's used, is a very important part of building a healthier, more consistent short hair. As long as that line breeding isn't taken too far and you have healthy Genetics dogs. that you're pulling from. Yep. Yes. So good question. Here's a quick one from A.W. Small nine, what kind of fabric do you choose for your dog platforms? So we're Perfect. using our Coranda dog beds for in the kennel as well as in the home. I use the exact same fabric, whether it's in the kennel or the house, though. I use the 40 ounce vinyl. It's super heavy duty. Uh, holds super up, durable. Holds up to digging on the bed, chewing on the bed uh, for an extended amount of time as well as super easy to wipe up. It doesn't have any porous fibers that are going to hold smell if there's an accident on that bed. Uh, so we really like that for both the house and the kennel. There's the mesh options, you know, especially if your dog's going to be outside for breathability and coolness. That's great too, but we really like the 40 ounce vinyl. Mm -hmm. Like I said, that's a quick and easy one. Quick and easy. All right, so this one says... <laughs> in preparation of the storytelling. Tina Tillman Pierce from Facebook got my first GSP puppy. Congrats. I researched and had an idea what I was getting into. I want an exercise companion mostly, but also looking into other things we can do to nourish his drive to hunt. I have been watching some of your videos and they're very helpful. Awesome. You're welcome. Two questions. He is four months old. How much exercise should he, can I do with him? Currently read, um... I'm currently really out of shape, aren't we all? And took him on a three mile, very slow paced run, but was told that's not a good idea yet. I feel like I should be taking him when I go for a run, but also don't want to injure him. Um, I actually, uh, so I go ahead say, and start with the first one about yeah, exercise. Um, Trina, thank you. You're also, you're also a member on Patreon, and oh. we've gone over these questions already, but I think that they're oh. great questions to, Oops. yeah, no, that's great. I think these are great questions to share with the rest of the world and show the kind of, I mean, these would be the direct feedback that she's already gotten on these questions, which is um, a great testament to how this process works. So, um, first of all, the exercise, the exercise aspect of things. Uh, you know, it's really going to come down to, yes, you don't want to push your dog to the extreme at that age, um, especially for things that are going to be super strenuous, like we show roading our dogs. You want full, as close to full bone development as possible, because they say that growth plates don't close until I've heard something over to um, anybody that wants to correct me on that. I would love to hear the exact uh, thing, but I believe it's over two years old before growth plates are fully closed. Um, and you're wanting not to cause damage to growth. So that's the, the people's, uh, words of caution to you, but just running on even surfaces and things like that aren't going to be that difficult, especially for a young short hair, three miles at a slow pace. Um, I'm going to say, if you're saying that you are out of shape, um, it's probably not that much activity or exercise in the grand scheme of things for your dog especially within the next month, it's going to be one of those where he's like, yeah, I got this three miles. That's a piece of cake. So I, I wouldn't be too concerned as long as that's not three miles of hard pulling with additional load bearing or strapped for harnesses, strapped with harnesses for roading or something along those lines. So 
um, as far as that goes. And just pay attention to your puppy. If he acts sore, that would be a time to slow down. Okay, check wow, we've overdone this. Yep, make yep. sure that you haven't overdone it. Yep. Now I've got the rest of that second part of the question. So second potty training is not going so well. Mostly he'll be outside for a while, then come in and pee. Or he'll go to the door and hit the bell, but then pee before we get there, which is pretty quickly. We do try to make sure we give lots of positive praise when we see him going outside. Any ideas? So there's a couple things that I mentioned with this. And one is, and we hear this a lot. My puppy was just outside. It came inside and peed. So the first question that we ask is, how long was your puppy outside? You have to think about the fact that their bladder, especially after drinking water in any amount of excess of, you know, they drink a good portion of water, they're going to have to pee. Um, and that a lot of that comes down to water intake. Um, I would say that it's one to two ounces of water per pound per day as a minimum water intake. Uh, but that's if you think about us, if we're drinking that one ounce of water per pound per day, if you actually stick to that, you got to pee a lot. So consider their bladders not being as developed as even ours, right? We're adults and everything else, but they're going to have to pee pretty regularly and they're not going to be as good at holding it. So potty accidents are normal. I don't think that you're too out far of the wheelhouse on that. The, the thing though is your puppy went outside, they played, they probably peed right away. And then did they play for 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, and then they came back inside. So the key with that is check and make sure that they pee before they come back in if there's any extended playtime outside. The next is if you're really struggling, if you've got a puppy that's already going to the door and ringing the doorbell, that's awesome. You're not very far from having zero more accidents. I mean, they're going to the door to potty means they know what's going on. They and they just, just can't quite hold it long enough. Yep. Underdeveloped bladder that's coming along and the behaviors are there. It's just going to take a little bit more bladder control and you'll be pretty solid on your potty training, it sounds like. And if we're really, really struggling, a lot of times what we'll do is, hey, baby, um, is not actually limit the amount of water that they have, but start to regulate the times in which they have access to water, which can give you a better idea of, okay, so this morning you had access to water, you drank a bunch, you're going to have to pee every 15, 20 minutes for the next hour or so, and then you should be able to go longer periods of time. Um, you can utilize crate training with that where you pottied, you can and you've, you've played and pottied. Now you can go in your crate for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. Now go out and potty and then play some more and then go in your crate. You can kind of help to better regulate those. because um, And that crate training really is something that we found that helps when we're, when we're struggling a little bit more. Yeah. So, great question. Next question from just bird dogging it up. Will you guys be making more puppy series again? Since everybody's asking about puppy stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we will. Uh, we are excited to keep a puppy out of Muddy's upcoming litter. Uh, she's been bred to Benny and she's due here pretty soon. So we're hoping to keep one of those puppies. And then once they hit eight weeks old, start rolling out some more training videos because like everyone knows, all puppies train a little bit differently. We can learn new things. We might throw in some new training things. We're always learning as well. So absolutely. The, the feel of the training series will probably be a little bit different. Um, and touch on a few of the more specific questions that we get about how to raise puppies. And um, so it'll have a little different feel, but we're definitely going to have a whole new series coming out. Ideally, within the next yeah, few months, it, we'll start. We'll so. hopefully have a little bit more cuts and B-roll and things like that put together instead of all the one take, one shot, live video feel that we'd done before that had crossed platforms to Instagram and Facebook really well. Uh, but the thing to remember is we're still going to be doing those videos in a live type situation. First time the puppies learn these things. First time we're working on these things, things we're struggling with. So that you get to see those and understand that, hey, we're professionals, but we also have struggles with puppies sometimes and they don't always do it right for us the first time either. So, yeah, I think that this, like she said, will be way more based around the struggles of raising a puppy as opposed to just how to do the training. Because, I mean... The training steps are there. They yes. don't really change, but we want to show more problems that can happen and, and how, to, how to fix them. Yep. Great question. Thanks for all your great questions. We're going to have to split this up again because there are so many of them. So tune back for part three.
I'm the guy with the pink gun. And I'm Kat, the dog trainer. We'll see you soon. Thank you.